you say, is it a myth or are we love to say human beings are rational beings? We, we've mouthed it so many times, but is it the truth? Tell me yes, no. Oh, I love this audience. So you agree human beings are irrational, right? Let's let's try and see if we can prove this hypothesis right or wrong either way. So I start with what is called as the IKEA effect. In the 1930s, and whatever I'm going to be talking today is not Sanjay Watch with no research behind it. Whatever I'm going to be talking about this morning has data research from well-established institutes across the world. So it's not coming as Sanjay Watch. Please don't say this. Understand that Sanjay Uva is speaking, it's research that's coming to you directly. So in the 1930s, um, in America, uh, like we have even today in our own homes, the mother is the nurturer of the family and she believes that she cooks well, the family is taken care of. That was the same thought that was there in America in the 1930s. And making a, baking a cake was a huge thing for every family. And when the housewife would make a good cake, that meant she was caring for the family, etc. And therefore, making a cake was, you know, a difficult task also because you had to start from scratch, get all the ingredients, put them together, put them in the oven and wait for those one or two hours then, of those old ovens, whether that cake will rise or not. And that was the acid test for every mom, for every homemaker. And most often the cake would rise, but sometimes it won't. So, um, Pillsbury, a large company there, uh, with their brand called Betty Crockers, we were, they were working on something called a cake mix. There were no cake mixes before that. So they came up with a cake mix, which they researched in the marketplace, and uh, you had to do nothing at all, just add the right quantity of water to it, put it in the oven at a certain temperature for a certain time, and the cake would rise, period. And once this was tested out in the marketplace, every housewife said that they'd love to buy it, right? So all tests cleared, they, were, they, they went ahead and launched in the marketplace. What happened? The cake bombed miserably. The cake mix bombed miserably. What had gone wrong? Research said this would be a very huge success. Now, there was a guy called Ditcher then, who was a market researcher and a marketer, and he conducted the research. And he came back to Pillsbury and said, look, we've got to do nothing else. Just get the woman involved in the baking of the cake process once again. So he separated the eggs. Have the, have the rest of the mix in one place and ask the woman to add the eggs again uh, to just um, batter it up and put it again in the oven and it do wonders. Now, Pillsbury was of course suspicious about this and, you know, when they aren't able to do the whole thing why would they want to add, add eggs to it? But they tried it out. And lo and behold, this time it did very well. It became a bestseller product. What had happened? Rationally, women women wanted a mix which they would just simply add water to and be successful at it, hundred percent guarantee. And now you, the campaign said, take the mix, add your eggs, and your cake. You made the best cake. Some of this like the headline said, you made the best cake. The idea was research then later told them that you have removed when you remove the woman's role from baking the cake, she felt it was like any other cake you buy from the market. And she was not a part of the nourishing culture of the family. Step one. Step two. Something stuck. Can anyone help me, please? Nothing's working. So I have a few interesting stories about this on the green here. We, okay. Then comes McDonald's. We've all been exposed to it from, since childhood. You know. Now, there was a research conducted at Stanford in which children aged between 3 to 5 years were given packets of um, fries. Okay. Some fries came out of unmarked packets and they tasted that. Imagine, aged between 3 and 5 years of age. And some were given packets of McDonald's and the fries coming out from there. 74% kids said that the fries coming out of the McDonald's pack tasted far better. Whereas this, the truth was both fries came from the same source. What had happened? Kids 3 to 5 years of age, their taste was being manipulated by the brand on the package. That's how impressionable we are. And of course there's been a 
they were latest suits filed against uh, McDonald's for not manipulating kids. In fact, I don't know if you are aware, world's biggest toy distributor isn't a toy company, it's McDonald's. The world's biggest toy company, alright? So, since childhood, when you are giving out toys as incentive and bombarding them with that advertising, that aroma, the minds, the brains of kids are impressioned to believe and coming to that research in a while where they, their taste buds are not making a rational decision but are being make, the decisions are being filtered through certain other areas of the brain which tell them something else. So the taste is not the point there. What is in the mind is the point there. Third story, I don't know, I'm sure most of the marketing kids would have heard this story. Coke. Uh, in the 80s, they were being challenged by Pepsi to the blind taste uh, test campaign, right? Blind taste test campaign. Uh, what Pepsi was doing was serving up unlabeled colas, marked A, B, to everyone in stores, malls, etc., and asking them which is better. And 51%, 51% plus of people would say, this is better, and that turned out to be Pepsi, and that was the truth. Even Coke did its own market research and found out that in blind test situations, Pepsi stands out as a, as a better tasting drink, as a better tasting cola. Now, uh, they went back to their, so they were eating into their market share, Pepsi was eating into Coke's market share. So what they did was they reformulated the Coke and relaunched it as the new Coke. That's the classic version and that's the new Coke. It was launched as a new Coke. Before this, before the launch, two lakh respondents were tested with the new formulation of Coke. Two lakh, seventy-one percent said the new Coke is not only better than the old Coke, but is far better than Pepsi. Two lakh is a huge number to test out in market research. The company was very sure it was onto a winner. Launch was a lot of fanfare, huge. Humongous budgets, who has no probably you know limitations of what they can spend. Huge budgets. What happened? Within 70 days, they had to withdraw the new book. What had happened was they were getting a few lakh calls complaining why has the old book been withdrawn? They were getting in fact people were buying new book and putting it in sewers in Los Angeles and other cities. Okay, there was virtually riots in the streets. Those who had old coke available that was selling in the black market for a premium. People just refused to buy the new coke. Why? Could two lakh people be wrong who were tested and they completely agreed that they would buy this product in this case far better? So then the, the real answer, in fact um, the CEO then Dominic Kerr said all the time and money poured into consumer research of new coke could measure and reveal the depth and abiding emotional attachment to the original coke. So there's something more than reason that was happening there. And this was proved by another study which happened in 2005 when fMRIs came out. So they would be given unlabeled drinks. New Coke, Old Coke, Pepsi. So like the earlier studies, every respondent said blind test Pepsi is better than Old Coke. Now, the second time around, with the fMRIs on, they were labeled and told this is Coke and this is Pepsi. And if the results would change, 74% would say the new Coke is, the old Coke is better than the Pepsi. What had happened? So the brain scans revealed in the first stage, in the blind test scenario, the area of the brain responsible for detecting taste was lighting up. That means there was more blood supply there, there was activation of the neurons there. Only that area was becoming active. Whereas when the labels were put on, in addition to that area, a lot of areas surrounding it also became active. That means this was the area responsible for memories, thinking, good times, etc. Alright, this area was also lighting up. Just the label coming on and different areas of the brain become involved in the decision making of you. Another study, and that comes from the field of medicine again, Dr. Antonio Damasio had a patient called Eliot. Now, Eliot developed a tumor in his whole brain. So surgically it was removed. Now he was a typical businessman, good at everything, good human being, good husband, good father, running his business well, had this brain tumor, I'm getting a very long story short, and the tumor was removed surgically. So when you remove a tumor, you have to remove a lot of area around that. Brain. So that was also removed along with. After recovery, most of his behavior was alright, perfectly alright. 
But when you go to a superstore or a mall and buy basic stuff like a toothpaste or a breakfast cereal, he would stand there for hours not knowing what to buy. Simple decisions which you would do earlier very easily, not even think about it. Uh, buy a cereal box, put it in the cart, etc. He was unable to make these kind of decisions. What was going wrong? So there was another research conducted, and it was found because his emotional area was also surgically removed along with the tumor. Without the participation of emotion, even rational, reasonable, simple decisions could not be made. That tells us that even the decisions we, which we believe are purely reason based cannot be taken without the emotional support. What involvement of the emotional brain in it? That tells us how important emotion is. In fact, I have two very quick stories to tell you. One is the music manipulation. Now, something has gone with the slide formatting. The world is and the whole thing is shrinking and something is happening there. But just don't pay attention to that. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, in a store in UK, this experiment was conducted. That store would sell wines. Okay. So, they noticed on the days when you played German music, German wines outsold French wines 3 to 1. And on days when you played French music, French wine sold, outsold German wine series to one. But the schematic part is after that. When they inquired from the buyers whether they had heard the music, paid attention to the music, they were blissfully unaware of any music or maybe something in the background was happening. So consciously, they were not being influenced by that music, but subconsciously, it was influencing their buying behavior. So go back to the reptilian you know. world. Then, if, if that's not only the case, Another study which was reported in the Indian Journal of Marketing, uh, in, a, in a typical Nike store, what they did was, on some days they would introduce a certain fragrance, on other days they would not introduce the fragrance in the store. Guess what the results were? On days when fragrance was introduced, the propensity of purchase as reported by the audience was about 60% higher and they were ready to pay a 10 to 15% premium for the same pair of Nike shoes. Whereas, on the days when the fragrance was not introduced, this is not the case. This is the introduction. Now you know why malls introduce baking fragrance on the AC events when you are on the second or the third floor, so you start feeling hungry and rush to the food court. So there are a lot of such. So this, the, the whole reason I do this talk is for both. One, which I'm going to prove again, and there are many such cases because we have only 18 minutes, so I can only outline a few. You can use this for the goodness of humanity by improving customer experience and customer experience is experienced by the subconscious. Okay, not the conscious at times. I'll come to that too. And you can also use the, the sciences to manipulate consumer behavior, especially children. So we have to be aware of that too. So what are the learnings from this? Gerald Zellman, Harvard Business School. He says 95% of purchase decisions are controlled by the subconscious. Why we love to believe we are rational human beings making reasonable rational choices, most of our choices are happening below our conscious radar. We don't even know. You selected your husband or wife, remember this, or you're going to do that soon. So be aware of your subconscious. That guy will make, the reptile will make the decision, not the human being. Right? <coughs> And uh, there's, there's a famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow, I don't know how many of you have read it, read it. You, will, you are the um, Department of Business Economics, you should read this book, you can't avoid it. He's a, a Nobel laureate uh, and he has this um, proven hypothesis now that our brain has two systems, system one and system two. The system one works in shortcuts, it comes from the reptilian brain where we don't consciously think and take decisions. Whereas well, system 2 is the rational brain, where you have to think about, so if I give you a mathematical problem, 238 to multiply by 2, 429, you will have to use the rational brain, the system 2. The system 2 takes more energy, more blood, instantly brain makes up only about 2% of the body weight, but consumes about 18% of our blood energy, blood flow, right? So, in any case, it is using more energy, so it wants to um, conserve energy. So, System 2 will use more energy, is not energy efficient, will use conscious, more number of neurons, etc. And therefore it's difficult and therefore evolution has primed us, programmed us for survival and therefore be alert and therefore act subconsciously. So if, if something pounces on, before the something pounces on us and we hear some rustle, we have to take that message. Okay, so that's a subconscious. 
So we are primed for that. Remember this. So this system one and system two, we can always prove this through a game. Have you ready? Yeah? Your time. And you have to do it very fast. Only then this will work. Otherwise, this is not to work. Read this with me. Blue, red, yellow, green, orange, yellow. Make a photo Come on, quick. Blue, red, yellow, green, orange, yellow, red, blue, orange, green, red, orange, green, yellow, blue, yellow, blue, red, orange, green, red, blue, orange, green, yellow. What's happening? The system one is fighting the system two. The system one sees the color. Optical uh, nerves are many, many times faster than the other stimuli. So, you see the color and you say, you don't read the alphabets. Whereas, when you reach here, it reads yellow, but it is red. So, there is a conflict between system 1 and system 2. Okay, and therefore you go slow. So, shortcuts lead to short circuits in our mind. Is that clear? So, we prove it every time, every hall, this happens. Suddenly, your volume goes down, your speed goes down, because the system 1 is conflicting with the system 2. And this is the world of neuromarketing, essentially. All, that, all the stories that we've told you are basically now a part of a huge new area, not new anymore, it was new 10 years ago, but a lot of work is done now and there are a lot of equipment and tools available to measure the sweat on your hands, eye tracking, exactly where your point, eye is pointed, that tells you the interest, the FMRI which talk about excitement, where the blood flows more and which part of the brain is active, etc. So all that, there are lots of tools and uh, the result is that the 50 shades of blue. Google conducted an experiment. You search anything on Google, results are thrown up on a page, and you know that top three or four are advertisements. When you click on them, that's how Google makes money, as simple as like that, right? The first two or three are ads. Now, as human beings, we would believe that if something interests us, we will click on that. Won't we? And if it doesn't interest us, we will not click on that, right? But Google's results prove something very different. Then they had 43 shades of blue tested out first. Then this list was expanded to 50 shades of blue, tested out, 1% sent out as one color of blue to one set of the population, 1% to another one, etc, etc. These shades were so close to each other that on the conscious level you would probably never see a difference between the two. Never see a difference between the two. Yet, one particular shade of blue, which is slightly on the popular side, resulted in 200 million worth, dollars worth of revenue extra for Google that This one. And they, of course, dropped that shade of blue. At the conscious level, I, don't, I see no difference in that. But my subconscious is far more powerful and as creative people we know it. Because when you're thinking about an idea, you're working on it, it never comes to you. But when you are some, doing something completely different and not in that zone, probably having a bath, suddenly, aha! This aha moment is nothing but subconscious sending a signal to you. All your Eureka, what was Eureka? Remember Archimedes? He, ran, he said to ran out of uh, the last of naked through the streets of the street shouting Eureka, Eureka, Milia, Milia, Camilia. He was searching for something, he was he applied all his mind, he was the biggest scientist then, couldn't find it, and suddenly while in his bath, he found it. He was not thinking about it. Subconscious. Similarly, Ekule. Who was Ekule? Remember? Some of you? Benzene, aromatic structures? Yeah? How did he discover it? He in his brain saw a, a snake with, a, with its own tail in its mouth. And therefore he would think of real structures. He didn't come to another scientist, it came to him from the subconscious. He started believing on his subconscious. It's far more powerful than your conscious and 95% decisions are still being taken uh, by that. And the last one, this comes from Amsterdam. The urinals of Amsterdam is called uh, airport, Amsterdam's airport. So, you know, uh, male urinals are far more difficult to clean, are far more expensive to clean because there is a lot of spillage. Why? Because males are bad shooters. Alright? So they, they tend to be in their own world, <laughs> there is a lot of spillage and a lot of cost of cleaning up. So uh, they, they were conducting this meeting there and figuring out what can be done about it. So someone suggested a, a very simple trick, okay, and which was to paint a fly near the outlet. Guess what happened? 86 percent reduction in spillage and 8 percent reduction in the cost of cleaning up. Is that that level means or not? What were we doing? Subconsciously aiming for the fly. <laughs> That's how powerful is that So you can use it for public good or you can use it for manipulating people and making them mad. Thank you so much for being so kind. Thank you.